Um, today, we got a mouthful. We're going to deal with the uh, minor prophets of Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. It's not as much as it sounds because some of these are very small. Obadiah, the first one of these, for instance, is only one chapter. So we will, we're going to go through all of this. Um, this is our outline, of course, for the class. We dealt first with the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Jeremiah's book Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then we include Daniel, which a lot of Protestants do in the major prophets. The, um, the Jewish Bible counts Daniel among the writings because it's not really, it's, Daniel is unique. I mean, it's, it, Daniel is to the Old Testament what Revelation is in the New Testament. It's, not, it's very hard to define exactly what it is. It doesn't fit into other categories. Last week we started the book of the Twelve, or the Minor Prophets, which as we talked about in the Hebrew Tanakh, or the Hebrew Bible, the book of the Twelve Minor Prophets are one book, called the Book of the Twelve. And there is um, more and more, even Protestant scholars are beginning to see the, the, the reason for that, because when you look at them all together, you get a much more comprehensive. The Twelve Minor Prophets together give you pretty much the whole picture of the prophetic message and meaning in the same way that each one of the minor prophets, Jeremiah, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, for instance, are very complete. They're very long. Isaiah is 66 chapters. The longest of the minor prophets is 14. So that's why you have major prophets and minor prophets. All that means is length. Major prophets are longer than minor prophets. It has nothing to do with, with the importance of the message. So uh, today we're going to be looking at Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And then next week, the post-exilic prophets, the ones who prophesied either during or after the Babylonian exile, after the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah and took them off into captivity. Um, and then the final week, and uh, sometime this next few days, I'll be sending out to you or having available to you next week the study notes for the test. I can't do it too early because then I'm, you know, there's stuff that we, we're going to be doing the last week or two that's not included. So I will probably have it this week. Make it available via email, or actually what we'll do is we'll put it on the website. So check check this weekend on the website if you want to, and if not, I'll have copies of it for you next Wednesday when you come in if you can't access the website, okay? And you all still know that you can access the website to watch the videos or review the materials or whatever, all right? And then the final week, we'll do a review of the message of the prophets uh, for the first hour, and the second hour will be our final exam, which I'm sure everyone is going to take because it is a great advantage to you to learning the material. I will give you the... the well, everything you need to know. You know, if you study the material I give you, then you should do very, very well. And typically in our classes, our courses, people do tremendously well on the exam. Okay, almost everybody makes, well, the vast majority of people make 90 or more on our exams, so it's not something to worry about. Okay, uh, today we're looking again the 12 minor prophets, or the book of the 12. Last week we dealt with Hosea, Joel, and Amos. This week we're dealing with these six, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nathan, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And yes, there are different ways to pronounce this. I pronounce Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Other people pronounce it Habakkuk, which sounds sort of crude to me, so I say Habakkuk. And you can pronounce it however you want. People's names are pronounced differently, right? Um, Obadiah, the first one we're going to look at, deals with um, a prophecy of the destruction of the nation or kingdom of Edom. We'll talk about that. Jonah, you probably know more about than any of the other minor prophets because you know about the big fish. Even though that actual, that actual scenario is a fairly small part, even of the fairly small book of Jonah. Uh, the, the, the being swallowed by the big fish and then vomited up on land, which is a wonderful expression, um, is not, very, not a very substantial part of that book, but that's the part everybody knows, is Jonah and the, and the whale, or Jonah and the big fish. Then we're going to look at um, Micah, the prediction of destruction and messianic restoration. Uh, Nahum, the prophecy of the destruction of Nineveh. Jonah and Nahum are unique in that the, they both are prophets to the nation of Assyria and the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The horrible Assyrians that destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in, two, in 722 and then threatened the southern kingdom of Judah in 701. Um, two of the minor prophets are specifically tasked to go and prophesy either to them or about them. All right? Then Habakkuk, where God is questioned. Habakkuk, Habakkuk has two questions, or they're often called complaints, and they really are. They're respectful, but it's God saying, it's uh, Habakkuk saying, God, uh, are you paying attention? Because this doesn't seem quite right. 
Then we'll talk about Zephaniah, and Zephaniah is the one that emphasizes the day of the Lord more than any other, and that is the prediction of the day of the Lord as judgment. But still, as with, is true with virtually all of the prophets, there is always that sense of restoration. You will remember that uh, the, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, have typically have three primary messages that they are communicating. First, you have broken the covenant and you better repent. That's number one. Second, no repentance, then there is going to be judgment, and it will be horrible to behold. Third, even in the midst of judgment, there will eventually be restoration. So, you've broken the covenant, you will be judged. Um, if you, you've broken the covenant, you better repent. Uh, if you haven't repented, there will be judgment, but eventually there will be restoration. In some of these minor prophets, you see all three of those. But for the most part, you have to look at all 12 of them together to get that complete prophetic message. When you look at the major prophets or some of the longer, uh, more complete of the minor prophets, uh, the whole, the, all three of those things are there. But taken together, the Book of the Twelve is a very complete presentation of that. Okay, uh, and that is the prophetic message. Those three points is the is the prophetic message of the Old Testament. We've looked at this chart before. Today we're going to be talking about Obadiah, whose prophecy is to Edom. He's one of the earliest of the prophets. Joel. Um, could be here, it could be over here. We're not really sure. Joel is, so, Joel is sort of an anomaly. It's not really clear where he fits. Um, today we're in uh, Obadiah, uh, Micah, Jonah, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So these are the prophets we're going to be talking about today. You'll notice two of them. Jonah and Nahum were the prophets to Assyria. Um, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah to the kingdom of Judah, and Obadiah to Edom. And this gives you a timeline from 1000 BC to 400 BC, and the, the period of the ascendancy or the dominance of the nations of Assyria, of Babylon, and then of Persia. The next week we'll be looking at um, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, which are the post-exilic prophets after the Babylonian exile, which is this gap, during the Persian period. Okay? Make sense? I know that I'm repeating myself on some of this stuff, but that's hopefully to help you learn it. Okay? You can keep going over it. Yes. It's finally got through to me that all these nations have indeed been destroyed. Uh, it's true. I mean, it's Assyria, Babylon, Persia. There are still remnants of their cultures, just like there is Egypt. You know, uh, we're no longer in the, the pharaohic period of Egypt. Egypt was the longest lasting. In fact, if you study ancient history, virtually every other nation's timeline or history is linked to Egypt. And the reason is because the Egyptians are, they started before anybody else and went after everybody else. I mean, Egyptian empire still continued after almost all of these were gone. And the Egyptians kept excellent records. We knew exactly, we know exactly when, um, they're very time oriented, the Egyptians, partly because their whole culture was, was around the um, rise and fall of the Nile River. And so they were very oriented towards seasons, and that meant they were very oriented toward time periods and how much time has passed. And so, because the Egyptian records are very clear, who was king, what year was it, what events were taking place, and then the Egyptians also had relations with almost all these other nations, either positive or negative. And so you either have a record of communication that they have, there are we have in Egypt, they found all sorts of letters written to, to kings and people in Judah, for instance. Uh, because they had relationships. Or there are stories about battles that occur. And so they're able to link up the histories of those other nations to events in the Egyptian calendar, and that's one of the things that helps us date them, because Egypt did a much better job of keeping a, cl a clear and, and understandable calendar than most nations did. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Egypt is in there too, although Egypt, none of the pro prophetic work is to or about Egypt, although Egypt is always there. Egypt was the major uh, political opponent of Assyria until the rise of the Babylonians. Egypt was then the primary opponent of the Babylonians until the rise of the Persians. Egypt would continue to be the major opponent to the Persians. So Egypt, you know, they would wax and wane as well, but they never completely were, you know, obliterated. Whereas the kingdom of Assyria ended. The kingdom of Babylon ended. The kingdom of Persia ended. That never really, you know, Egypt just sort of petered out back there somewhere. You know, it didn't quite, it wasn't defeated, destroyed, and conquered. The Romans did defeat it, and there was some of that. That's why you get Cleopatra and Mark Antony, you know, that stuff. That's 
much later, so we won't get into that. But um, and the burning of the library in Alexandria. So um, anyway, <laughs> it's all very interesting stuff. Um, this gives you a sense of where they were. Um, in terms of the nations being destroyed, people who live in Iran today would say, well, no, we're the Persian Empire. Uh, people who, uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq was, de was determined to try to rebuild Babylon because he wanted to claim the glories of the Babylonian Empire. Well, nobody's ever been successful at recou you know, recouping past glories of these ancient kingdoms, but there have been people who intended it. I remember um, an episode of um, the gangster, Tony Soprano, the Sopranos. Uh, there was an episode once where, where Tony Soprano and one of his friends, you know, they're, they're uh, trying to force this Jewish man to do something. I don't even remember what it was. And the Jewish guy said, you know, we Jews have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Where are the Romans? And Tony Soprano said, standing right here, you know, because they're Italian, of course. But, um, so you get the idea that there are people who would argue that some of these kingdoms never went away, but in terms of any kind of influence or organization or whatever, they have. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned Babel, uh, Babylon and Persia. How about the Assyrians today? That, that would be, uh, the Assyrians would be northern Iraq as well. Northern Iraq. Yeah. Okay. Um, Assyria and Babylon, we'll look at them out again in a minute. Assyria and Babylon would have been northern Iraq. Persia is Iran. Okay, the Iranians. Okay, let's... Talk about the book of Obadiah. Now, as we start with Obadiah, I, I want to point out that there are four of the prophets, and here I'm talking about all the prophets, major and minor. Four of the prophets are identified or labeled as non standard prophets. What we mean by that is the, most of the prophetic messages were to either Judah, the kingdom of Judah, or the kingdom of Israel before that, or both. There are four of the prophets who did not prophesy to Judah or Assyria or both, and those were Daniel, again, the, the Jews consider Daniel part of, the, part of the writings section of the Hebrew Bible. We consider it him one of the major prophets. So Daniel dealt with world empires. You know, he was in Babylon, he's dealing with world empires that are to come, various, you know, Greece and Rome and various others, depending on who you ask, how you interpret uh, Daniel's visions. But then you have three of the ones we're going to talk about today, Obadiah, Jonah, and Nahum. None of those three minor prophets dealt with uh, Judah or Israel or both. Um, Obadiah, that we're going to talk about first, preaches to Edom, the kingdom of Edom. I'll show you a map. Um, Jonah and Nahum, as I said a minute ago, preach to Nineveh, which is the capital city of Assyria. Neither of those three have any references to Judah or Israel or the things that everybody else it's also true that um, these three emphasize typically either warning, um, you know, warning or judgment or restoration, but not very complete packages. So they're not these these four sort of stand out. And the first of the minor prophets to stand out in that way is Obadiah. So Obadiah is writing to the kingdom of Edom, which is south of Judah. I'll show you a map in a second, and he's writing shortly after the fall of Jerusalem. The reason we know that is part of what happens is, and this is only one chapter, you know, the book of Obadiah is just one chapter, that Obadiah is, is one of the accusations against the nation of Edom is that when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, the Edomites showed up and started helping themselves, you know, they, they started plundering Jerusalem along with the Babylonians. And they actually were relatives. The nation of Edom was a Semitic nation, meaning they were cousins. Um, the, the Jewish people descended from Jacob and then Jacob's sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's brother was Esau, right? Okay, these are the two sons of Isaac, Jacob and Esau. Esau's other name, which was given to him when he was born, is Edom. Edom means red, because he apparently was red when he came out. Okay, so the Edomites, the nation of Edom, are the descendants of Esau and therefore are Semitic. They are descended from Jacob, but or, I'm sorry, from uh, Isaac, but they are in, in, from there to Noah's son Shem, which is where we get Semites. So they're cousins of the Jews, but they are not part of the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, make sense? Just a different line of descending from Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob and Esau. Esau being the, the, the ancestor of Edom. All right. Um, 
There are numerous similarities between this book, um, the book of Obadiah, as short as it is, and the book of Jeremiah. In fact, there are passages that seem almost verbatim. Um, it's also true that Amos carries some judgments against Edom, and so uh, both Amos and Jeremiah have similarities to this short book of Obadiah. This is the map, a map. Which, yay! <laughs> Do I like that? No. Okay. Um, the kingdom of Israel, when it existed here, and you'll notice the capital was Samaria. Later on, after the kingdom of Israel was destroyed, this whole region became known as Samaria. Okay? Here in the south is the kingdom of Judah, with the capital of Jerusalem, right there. Then, um, and you'll notice Israel was actually bigger, you know, it, it went Transjordan, meaning across the Jordan, it included areas over here, which was what we would have known as Gilead, okay, the Transjordan area, where two of the tribes of Israel asked if they could settle over there, and Moses said they could as long as they helped the other Israelites conquer, conquer the Promised Land, which they did. All right, up here you have the kingdom of Aram, or Damascus, at the capital city Damascus, here you have the kingdom of Ammon, the Ammonites, the kingdom of Moab, the Moabites, and their capital cities of Rabbath Ammon and Dibon. Now, all, most of these areas have connections to, the, the, to Abraham. Abraham was everybody's father, you know, Father Abraham. Um, Abraham's nephew was Lot. Remember Lot? Lot had two illegitimate sons, and those sons were Ammon and Moab. They are, so the kingdom of Ammon and the kingdom of Moab were descended from Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. Right? Can't tell the players about the program. But the idea is uh, the connections there. And then Edom down here with the capital city of Petra. And today, if you go to Petra today, it's in Jordan, uh, modern day Jordan. Petra is this extraordinary stone city. Well, Petra was built after the destruction of the kingdom of Edom when it became. Uh, uh, the, the Nabataeans came in and took over. And so uh, the city of Petra today, the stone city of Petra, which is one of the marvels of the whole world, and I haven't been there, I'll look forward to it someday, um, was built by the, the people who came after Edom, the Nabataeans. All right? But, and you'll notice this is Nabatu tribes. These people came over later and took over this region and, and it became Nabatea. Yes? Is Petra the one that I thought were. Um a scenario that when God says, you know, flee all of you when the day of judgment comes, is it Petra that? Um, there is a reference to fleeing to Petra. There's another reference to fleeing to the mountains. And um, I'd have to look that up. I seem, seem to recall that you're right, that there was a reference to fleeing to Petra, which means fleeing south. Now, um, which would be down here, down south. There, there was a time, a period of time in which, if you, have you heard the expression, I do mea? Yes. Okay, well, Idumea is a cognate with Edom. You hear the sound similarity. Idumea was, there was a period of time in which there was a kingdom called Idumea, which was the southern part of Judah, and the northern part, it was smaller, but it was like right in here. So Idumea and Edom were related to one another. Idumea is a smaller section and a little, little outside the, the kingdom of Edom. Okay, and then over here you get Phil, uh, the Philistine states. Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod. Up here you get the Phoenician states. We talk, you hear about Sidon, Tyre, uh, Acre, which is now, it was one of the, uh, the uh, crusader cities and is now part of uh, Israel. Um, Beirut has been around for thousands of years. It's a very ancient city, Beirut. Um, so you get kind of the layout. You'll notice up here the Assyrian Empire. Over here would have been the Babylonian Empire, you know, um, and you sort of get the layout. All right, questions about that? You now have a sense of where <clears throat> Edom was. Again, they were cousins of the Jews. When Jerusalem was conquered by Babylon from over here, the Edomites came up and helped themselves. And so part of the judgment is against the nation of Edom. And they talk about you mistreating your brother Jacob. Brother meaning that you're related to him, and yet you treated them as though they were your enemies. Um, it's also true as you read through the prophets, from time to time, Edom is used symbolically to represent all of the non-Jewish nations that God will judge. And so it's, it's sometimes used symbolically as all other non-Jewish nations that will be a target of, of, of Yahweh's judgment. Um, I could give you some other little bits, you know, factoids, but 
And beyond that, I think you'll be confused. Now, yes, ma'am. How do they determine these mics? Is this just a standard uh, word that they added on to? Yeah, place? I mean, um, it, it wasn't always it. You know, uh, like Carolyn and I lived in Washington, Washington State. We were Washingtonians. She was from Wisconsin. It's an English thing. I it's an English thing. We, we, we have different. Or something. It's just yeah, but we there's different endings that you put on things. Okay. You know, somebody from Mexico is not a called a Mex is not called a Mexicite or Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's no standard. It, 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 it may just on that. It's just something. That yeah, you know, the the people small. from Sidon were not called Sidonites. They were called Sidonians. Oh. All right, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. And people from Tyre, people from Tyre were Tyrians. You know, so no, probably the historians. You know, it's, it's very hard to know. Uh, and you know, Carolyn's from Wisconsin. I sometimes say that they're the Wisconites, but then you know, I think they would say Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. People from Wisconsin. That's what they call. That's what we call. That's what we say. Cheesehead, you can't get it. So you get the idea. Okay, um, that's what we're talking about with Obadiah is talking about the kingdom of Edom. And Edom comes up a lot of other places as well. The, the prophetic books that have judgments against the nations, those judgments will be against Edom and Moab and Ammon and the Philistines. And, and they don't talk about, Phoenicia was just a, a way of lumping them together to be able to talk about them. But they'll talk about, you know, uh, Sidon and Tyre, for instance, are listed in the judgments against the nations. They were sort of city-states. Phoenicia was not a nation so much as it was just a people, all of whom were involved in maritime practices, so they lumped them together just when they would talk about them, okay? Uh, but, and then you get Assyria, and you get Babylon, and, and you'll get uh, mentions of Aram or of Damascus, uh, you know, as, as a powerful city. So this gives you an idea where some of those names come from when they talk about judgments against the nations that were surrounding Israel, okay? Right, let's look at the book of Obadiah. It starts out... Uh, Obadiah is one of the six minor prophets that does not have what's called a historical superscription. Historical superscription means, do they tell you when they were writing? Of the twelve minor prophets, six of them, as you'll see in a minute, and some of the others, will say, you know, I, Micah, writing during, during the time of kings, Jotham, Ahab, uh, you know, Ahaz, Hezekiah, etc. Six of them have no historical superscription. In other words, they don't tell you exactly when it was they were, they were writing. In some cases, we can uh, base that on other information in the book, or like uh, in the case of Jonah, Jonah's, Jonah is a prophet, and it, we know it's the same one because it's, they, they say Jonah, son of uh, Amittai, is mentioned in 2 Kings. So we know exactly historically where that falls, even though Jonah also has no historical superscription, as it's called. <laughs> Obadiah does not tell you specifically when he's speaking, all right? But by the nature, we know that it's sometime right after 586 B.C. because he specifically is talking about the Edomites helping plunder Jerusalem when it was destroyed by the Babylonians. So we know it's sometime pretty soon after that. Okay, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom, the kingdom of Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. This is a book about judgment against the nation of Edom. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Now, part of Edom was a very mountainous area. In fact, if you, if you look at this whole region, you know, there's, there are the plains, obviously this is the Mediterranean Sea coast. There are areas along here, all the way down, that are level plains. And that's where you get the plain of Sharon and other places that they grow a lot of food. Right along here, all the way down, there is a ridge of mountains. There's a spine of mountains that is um, west of the Jordan River and west of the Dead Sea, which is what this is, and the Sea of Galilee up here. This spine of mountains that comes down through here is what you usually see pictures of if you see Israel. You don't see flat plains growing crops and stuff. You see mountains and rocks and dry and everything else. Well, that usually is along here, and the reason is because if I draw a line down through here, you get Jerusalem and Hebron and Beersheba and Bethlehem and all those are in that area. Because when the Israelites 
started conquering the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, they defeated the, the tribe, the, they, they crossed over here first, and so they defeated the first tribes they came to along this mountain ridge, and then they sort of gave up. The next generation comes along, and they're, they're not up for battle as much, and so they stop before they take over the whole land. Well, this ridge of mountains comes down into Edom. Edom had a series of fortresses that were built into the mountains. And that's why, and they were, they were very powerful. They were pretty much impregnable, they thought. And so that's why you get, you who live in the clefts of the rocks make your home in the heights. These are fortresses built into the ravines and crevices of these mountains so that they're protected by the mountains. And that's what that reference is. And because it was mountains is also why you get sort of like an eagle. You know, the people lived in these cities that were built in the mountains. Yes? What is that mountain range called? Um, I, the Judean Mountains in, in, in the north. Yeah, Judean it's the Judean Mountain, mountain Range. Judean mountain range. Um, I don't know if it has a different name further south or not. But if you look at any, t in fact, your book has, a, has some maps that are topographical, and you can see that ridge of mountains. Now, there's always been a, a road that ran right along the top of those mountains, even though it's a very difficult terrain, because of connecting cities, you know, like Jerusalem and Hebron and, and, and Bethlehem, etc. That's not the way most people would travel if they're going north and, like, if you're going from Egypt to Syria, you travel along the coast because the coast road was flat, much easier. You could do that until you got up near to Galilee, and then you run into a, an east to west ridge of mountains, and you have to turn inland uh, at that point. But, um, yeah, you should be able to find a topographical map uh, somewhere in there. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. Let's keep going. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Eden, the Edom, those of understanding, and the mountains of Esau? Esau and Edom are the same thing. Remember, uh, Jacob's brother Esau was also called Edom, and so Obadiah, and in other places they do the same thing. They'll refer to it by one of those two names, but they mean the same thing. They mean the kingdom of Edom. Okay? Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, meaning... Uh, the plundering that they, they plundered the Jewish people in Jerusalem when the, when the city was destroyed or conquered by the Babylonians. That's what the violence against your brother Jacob means, against the Jews. You will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stand aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. They participated in this plunder by the Babylonians. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. All of this has to do with Edom participating with Babylon in the, in the conquering and plundering of Jerusalem. The day of the Lord. See, this comes in here too. This is the day of judgment. And Obadiah mentions it. Zephaniah mentions it more than... Zephaniah mentions it 17 times in one chapter. The day of the Lord. Okay? So big emphasis there. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, meaning you were welcome in Jerusalem, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they never had been. Jeremiah talks extensively about drinking the wine of my wrath, God says. So here when Obadiah is talking about you will drink and drink and be as if you never had been, it means you are going to drink my wrath. And that's something that Jeremiah referred to. Uh, the judgment of the Lord is portrayed as a wine to be drunk. Okay? But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. Mount Zion is Jerusalem. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically it means Jerusalem. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will, influence, will possess his inheritance. Jacob is the Jewish people. Okay? Jacob will be a fire, and Joseph a flame. Joseph being one of the tribes of Israel. Esau will be stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau. The Negev desert is east. That's where the people, which said the Nabatu tribes, the Nabatu tribes invaded the land of Edom and became the, the Nabataeans. 
And actually, Herod the Great was a Nabataean. So they're the people from the Negev. Will occupy the mountains of Esau. Peoples from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. That's along the coast. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria. Ephraim is one of the tribes of the, of the nation of Israel in the north and is used as shorthand. This happens often that there will be references to like Ephraim meaning the whole, whole nation of Israel. Occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead. Benjamin was a tribe in the south. Gilead is east of the Jordan River. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad, I'm not going to go into a lot of those details. They're just locations in different places. Will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Picture is pretty clear. Edom will be judged. But eventually all the nations, as it says in uh, the first verse there, all the nations will be judged eventually. They carry, uh, most of the prophetic books carry judgments against all the nations. Every one of the major prophets has a long litany of condemnation of the nations. Yes? So the day of the Lord is when he's going to judge them, and they will be no more. And the day of the Lord is the final judgment at the end of time. Correct. Correct. Well, it's actually, it, it's actually the same thing. I mean, we the day of the Lord, as it's sometimes described in here, you're reading this stuff, Virtually every prophecy in the Old Testament, virtually every one, we need to understand as being now and future. All right? There, there was a present. Edom did get destroyed. But some of what's involved in the prophecy of woe or the day of the Lord prophecy against Edom has not been completed yet. For instance, particularly when they talk about the day of the Lord in judgment and then the final restoration. Well, the restoration part, the rest of it hasn't happened yet. Obadiah doesn't have so much restoration because it's so short. But um, so we see that part of the judgment has already happened, but much of it will, will still happen later. The ultimate judgment on the nations and the ultimate restoration, which we know now to be in Christ Jesus, will happen later. Okay. So it's both now and future. And we always have to have that perspective. People who, and I've had commentaries like this, people that read the Old Testament and the only way they see it is with regard to the ultimate fulfillment, they're only reading half of it. We also have to be sensitive to the fact that that was written for people who lived, you know, 1,700 years ago, uh, or 3,700 years, 2,700 years ago, sorry, and that it was, it was something for them too, as well as something future. It, it's not all about us, in other words, okay? There are other people involved in this. So we always have to have that understanding of tension, that these prophecies were for a more immediate uh, reflection and, and, and fulfillment as well as something that will be ultimately the day of the Lord and the final consummation. Okay? Fair? All right. Let's look now at, again, the one you probably know better than the others, the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah is another prophet without a historical superscription, meaning he doesn't say, I, Jonah, am writing during the time of. And we'll see, we'll see one that does in just a second. But we do know the pretty, pretty clearly the historical uh, time frame for Jonah, because 2 Kings 14.25 specifically mentions Jonah, son of Amittai, in a certain historical uh, circumstance. So we know when it was that, that Jonah was writing, even though Jonah doesn't tell us. We have reference elsewhere in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, in literary style, Jonah is not a traditional prophetic book. It is much more of a narrative, uh, historical narrative kind of thing. The prophetic books obviously are oracles and prop, you know, uh, statements of judgment against people or statements of blessing that's coming, etc., etc. Jonah is a story about two characters, Jonah and Yahweh, God. And then you know, there's some events, or sorry, you could say three if you want to include the whale, but um, the, there are the circumstances that they're involved in, but it's primarily a, a narrative and a discourse um, that's going on, conversation and events between Jonah and God not a statement of uh, judgment against Judah or Israel. In fact, Judah or Israel don't come into it. That's why this is considered one of the non-standard prophetic books, is it's not aimed at Judah or Israel or both, right? And you got that. That's what non-standard prophetic book means, is it's not, again, it's not aimed toward one or uh, both of the nations that the Jews uh, made up. So, we do know because of the reference in 2 Kings that this is during the time of Jeroboam II, who was you know, one of the kings in the north, 
And that means that um, Jonah was a contemporary, living, overlapped, living during the same time as Hosea and Amos. So, and you saw that from our chart, from our map. You can see sort of where people are based on that timeline. Now, um, this is a period of time, in fact, you're thinking, okay, this guy's going to, to, a, to the capital city of Assyria. Weren't those people really mean? <laughs> Weren't they, wasn't that rough? It's true that they were, but uh, Assyria went through, through fairly dramatic times of strength and weakness. There had been a first Assyrian Empire that has now, during the time of Jonah, has fallen into, you know, they're no longer as powerful. This is one of their, their waning stages. Um, not too long after this, in fact, somewhat right, well, right after the time of Jonah, um, about 745, you get a new king, Tiglath Pileser III, which I always have to say that because he's my favorite name in the whole biblical history, Tiglath Pileser III. If we had had a son, I think I would have named him Tiglath Pileser III. Have you been the fourth? Or the fourth, what's it? Just, yeah. Just call him Dre. Yeah. Tig. Um, Tiglath Pileser III became the king of Assyria in 745 BC, and almost immediately because of him, they ascended into power again. And between 745, 23 years later, 722, they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. By that time, they had reached the heights in terms of being the most powerful nation in the world. So this one guy, Tiglath Pileser III, really turned it around for them. He was like the Napoleon of the Assyrian history. And so very significant. But this period of time, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, is a time when they actually are in a, a, a waning period, where they're not very strong. In fact, we don't have history of a strong king during that time at all. So what are we, where are we talking about? This is the Assyrian Empire. Now, I told you there's two. There was the Assyrian Empire, the first Assyrian Empire, and then the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The same thing happened with Babylon. There was the first Babylonian Empire, and then the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Neo means new. Maybe you know that. Um, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, for instance, was when Nebuchadnezzar comes along. The Neo-Assyrian Empire was when Tiglath the Lazar made him great again. Well, to give you some idea, this light green area here, that was the first empire they had. You know, they ruled, so to speak. And then the second empire is uh, under Tiglath the Lazar is this darker green area here. Now, this, of course, is Judah. That's where we're talking about sort of Jerusalem being right there. This is Nineveh, okay? It's a long way, and there is not train service between those two, okay? You walk, or you ride a donkey. Um, well, that's, this is what we're talking about. Nineveh right here, sort of right in the middle. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. Um, Babylon right here was later to be the capital of the Babylonian kingdom. And then just to, to uh, do we even have it up here? Uh, Susa, right there. Susa is the capital of the Persian Empire. That comes up later. The book of Esther takes place there in Susa. So these, these cities are important. Nineveh, Babylon, Susa. And these rivers are the Tigris and Euphrates. This is Mesopotamia. Who knows what Mesopotamia means? Land between Run. the rivers. Land between the rivers. Mesopotamia, this whole region is called Mesopotamia, and it is the land between the rivers, means between Tigris and Euphrates. Almost all of civilization, as we understand it, started there. Why? Because these rivers made it fertile. There were uh, cattle were um, occurring naturally there before they were domesticated. Wheat and barley and other crops occurred there wild before they were domesticated. This was where civilization started, the Mesopotamian uh, river valleys. And this, this is all horrible desert. This is one of the most fertile areas the world has ever known. In fact, this sort of curve here, coming down to the Nile River, that's called the Fertile Crescent. Those of you who have taken survey classes, you've heard all this before, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again. All right, so that's what we're talking about, Nineveh, right there. Where do all those, that water come from, mountains up in the north? Yeah, in fact, the, the, uh, the, the source of some of these rivers has always been a real question because the, the um, Genesis says that the Garden of Eden was in the headwaters 
uh, the Tigris and you have uh, three rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Pishon rivers. And so you'd think, since we know where these rivers are, we have to be able to find Eden. You know, it'd be somewhere up here, because this is where those two rivers get closest. But the indication is that in very ancient times, the, um, the Euphrates River actually came down here. And that its source may have been down here around Sinai. It may have flowed through this area. You know, when you talk about five or 6,000 years, maybe, or more, then there could be significant changes. You have an earthquake, the whole river basins change. And so that varied. All right? But that's why we don't know where Eden is, because the rivers aren't where they used to be. And where is Mount Ararat? Ararat is down here in the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, no, this is Ararat. Ararat. That's in Turkey. Oh, Ararat. Ararat. I'm sorry, I was thinking. Sure. Yeah, okay. Sinai. Uh, Ararat uh, is not on the map. It would be somewhere up in here. Okay. Okay. Pretty far up in, in modern day Turkey. Great. Yeah. All right, so there's two maps. <laughs> well done. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jonah is a very interesting book because in many ways it provides a foil, sort of an alternative. When you, when, since most of the prophet, prophetic books are about the disobedience of God's people, this is a book, and, and disobedience of God's people when in some cases there were generations of prophets. You know, Jeremiah prophesied for over 50 years to, the, to Judah, and nobody would listen to him, ever. <laughs> Now you have, and those, those are God's people, the, people, the covenant people of God. Now you get Jonah, and as you'll see in a minute, Jonah preaches one sermon reluctantly, and the whole nation converts. <laughs> and it's almost as though God has done this and put this book in here in order to give, you, give us a, a counterpoint to the disobedience and, and the refusal to repent of, the, of his own people, the Israelites, Versus the fact that when God's word is spoken, even by a reluctant prophet, God, who is the God of all nations, that a nation like Nineveh, or Assyria, or the capital city of Nineveh, would convert immediately. So quickly, in fact, that Jonah doesn't like it. Okay, we'll see that. Uh, but the, the, a key point in all of this, too, is that God has compassion for all people. God is the creator and the Lord over all nations, and he has compassion for all people, as we see. Okay, let's read this. Chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And, and don't confuse Syria with Assyria. Not the same thing. Assyria was the ancient kingdom. Syria is a nation that has always existed, just north. Um, you know, we saw Aram and Damascus. Aram is the same as Syria. That nation has always existed. Okay. Um, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Best we can tell, Tarshish was a city on the coast of Spain, which means the other end of the Mediterranean Sea, as far as anybody knew they could go at this point. He literally is trying to go as far away as he can to the, to the ends of the known earth, the far end of the Mediterranean Sea to get away from God. He went down to Joppa, port city, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. <laughs> the captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will, will uh, notice us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. This was a way people made decisions in those days, and it was considered to be a way to let the gods give you information. You'll remember that the disciples, when they needed to replace uh, Judas Iscariot, they picked the two best candidates based upon the qualifications they agreed on, then they cast lots so that God would make the final choice. That's what these guys are doing, except they're, they're looking to other gods. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Sounds like somebody's mother. You know, but they're, getting, they're saying, wait a minute. 
the lot fell on you. We need to find out what's going on with you. Who are you? Where are you from? What's going on with you? Okay. Um, he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Good answer. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he would already told them so. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm going on this cruise because uh, I'm running away from God. <laughs> the sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? These sailors seem like very nice guys. <laughs> they really are trying to be decent fellows about it. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to throw him in the sea. That's something a sailor would not want to do to somebody else. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, um, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord who made, and made vows to him. So people came to believe in the one true God because of this event. Right? Keep going. Now this is the part everybody knows about, this one little section right here. <laughs> now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And by the way, the Hebrew word for fish and for whale, there's no differentiation. Anything that swam in the ocean, they didn't know mammal from fish. Okay, so that's why sometimes they say Jonah and the whale, sometimes they say Jonah and the fish. There's no differentiation in the Hebrew language. A huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, he said. Now this is Jonah's prayer, but let me say, it was common in, in, liter in literature of the ancient Near East. And the ancient Near East is what we call the Middle East, all right? The, the reason it used to be called the ancient Near East is now called the Middle East is the point of reference. It used to be everybody thought of, of Greece as the center of the world, and so you know the the Eastern Mediterranean nations was the Near East. Mm -hmm. Then the center of reference moved from Greece to Central Europe, basically Rome, and all of a sudden it wasn't near anymore. But it wasn't the Orient; it wasn't China. So it was the Middle East, same place. What we call the Middle East today is the ancient Near East. Sometimes you'll see the initials A-N-E, ancient Near East. It means this whole region of the Eastern Mediterranean. All right? In the literature of the ancient Near East, it was commonly held that when a person died, it took them three days to arrive in Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for the, the place of the dead. You know, wherever it is you're going to end up, the place of the dead. It took you three days. And that's why you often will get references. I mean, we believe Jesus really was on the third day raised. But there are frequent references to being dead for three days or being out of it for three days or something else for three days because that was a traditional you die. And it takes you three days before the ultimate of whatever happens. Okay. So Jonah prays. And he said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. He's repenting, and he's professing his faith in God here. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head, to the root of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. You'll notice he does not ask to be let out of the fish. That's not his request. It's a, it is a song of prayer and praise. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. This is the whole section that deals with the, the big fish. That's not the main point of Jonah. And by the way, I just will throw in here as an editorial comment. You've, I'm, no doubt, you've heard the story about how in the 19th century that an English sailor was swallowed by a whale, and then they 
got the whale and cut him open and he had found him there and he was, his skin was bleached white and he was blind and he was still alive and all that. Um, there's, there's not really very good evidence that that happened. Okay. It's, it's considered to be primarily, uh, it wouldn't be an urban myth because it happened in the ocean, but you know, <laughs> the idea. Um, but you know what? It doesn't matter. People who focus on that are missing the point. The point isn't to try to find some natural explanation for how this might have happened. Because the very fact that you feel like you need to find a nat natural explanation is to try to dismiss the miraculous aspect of it. When we always try, it can be interesting and not harmful necessarily, but when people argue that this really happened because there was a sailor in the 19th century England, da 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 da, then they miss the whole point. It was by a miraculous effort of God that this happened, and if you try to explain it by natural circumstances, you're, you know, you're swimming against the, the whole point. So don't do that. Okay, um, let's keep going. Skip to Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh, again, and proclaim it to it the message I give you. This time, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Now, this probably doesn't mean it takes three days to go through the city of Nineveh. There were no cities in the ancient time that big. I mean, you know, you could walk across Guadalajara in less than three days. And there, you know, so, um, probably. Uh, the, the point is that Nineveh, the, the names of the capital cities sometimes were used as synonymous for the countries, you know. Um, Jerusalem is often used as a reference for the whole of Judah, for instance. And so probably three days may have been how long he had to walk from the time he entered the Assyrian kingdom to the time he got to the city. All right, That makes more sense because it's unlikely it took him three days to walk through the city. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's a pretty succinct sermon. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. The idea of sitting in an ash pile is a sign of repentance. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, by the way, sackcloth is like burlap. Give you a picture. Okay, put on something just itchy, itchy and awful and not what you'd usually wear. And sit down in the dirt or in ashes as a sign of repentance. The decree of the, um, this is the proclamation he issued Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles: Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. I love that they include the animals, and there's actually a humorous ending to this this story, this uh, book, which you probably never noticed. We'll get to. Let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet re relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Okay? They confessed. They repented. God relented of his judgment. This is the last, Jonah 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Stomped his little feet, as I always say. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity, now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. He really is not happy that the Ninevites, the Assyrians, have repented and God has forgiven them. He's ticked off about this. John? Didn't, didn't, wasn't he angry at them because they had come down, they were a brutal people, and they had destroyed large sections of Israel. Oh, they had been. Well, they, the, the destruction of large sections of Israel mostly happened later. They were, again, they're in a weak time right now. Uh, they're not threatening anybody right now, but the, the initial Assyrian kingdom had conquered that whole light green area that we looked at. So yes, they were a warring people. They were well known for being violent. Nobody liked them. They were even worse later 
I mean, and, you know, the second, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was even worse. That's the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. Uh, uh, so, yep. One, one more question. Uh, when this revival took place, do historians have an idea of how long it, it lasted? Yeah, we know exactly. You mean this, the Neo-Assyrian Empire? No, I'm asking, this revival oh. took place as a result of his preaching. How long did that revival take place? Because now you just told us that they, they later then go down and destroy Oh, yeah, yeah. It didn't last long at all because in two books, and then we get to Nahum, we're going to find out that the judgment is against them. So it, it, lasted, it lasted a very short time. Yes? One of the reasons why the Assyrians were so brutal was that they were, they were at the top of the Fertile Crescent, and the people kept, armies kept marching through their land, tearing them up. And they just became tough as nails yeah. and tore everybody else up later. <laughs> yeah, sort of like the Germans in, in modern history. And also the principle is that if I can kick your butt, I'm going to. And the Assyrians <laughs> became very powerful, and so they ended up, you know, conquering everybody. Okay, let's keep going. But the Lord replied to this pouting thing, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. He just marched his little bottom out there and sat right down his house. Okay. It, it, it really, that, I'm not overstating it. That really is what this is. What's happening here? There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what was going to happen to the city. I'm just going to watch. He better, he better blow this place up. <laughs> Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. <laughs> but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Don't you hate it when God says, well, does that really make sense? <laughs> it is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. <laughs> I'll show you how I'm going to die. <laughs> but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? <laughs> it literally says, and also many cows? <laughs> That's kind of a funny thing to say. And it ends there. That's, that's the end. Um, one thing is the message that God is giving Jonah here at the end is you don't make anything, you don't create anything, you don't maintain anything, you don't cause anything to come or go in, in eventually or ultimately. Why do you feel like you have a right to be mad about what happens and doesn't happen? If I, God, who am the one who creates and maintains and makes to be, if I decide, especially if I decide out of compassion, for something to happen, who are you to be angry about what I choose to do? It's sort of like um, Jesus' parable about the workers, where he hires workers early in the morning, and then throughout the day he's hiring workers up until the you know the an hour before the end of the day. And he had told all he told the first workers how much he paid them for the day, and at the end of the day, workers came and he paid them the the, the people who came very late had only been working about an hour, and he paid them a full day's wage. And so the guys who'd been working all day thought, great, we're going to get a lot more. And when they got paid the same amount as the people who'd only worked for an hour, they said, wait a minute, this isn't fair. We worked all day. And he said, I told you what I was going to pay you, and that's what I paid you. Do you really have a right to be angry that I decided I wanted to pay these other people different? I was, I was honest with you. I didn't mislead you. You got what you were promised. Basically, that's what God is saying here is, I can do whatever I want because it's mine to do with who are you going to get mad about that? But Jonah did. And there were many cows. <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay, let's take a break. Start back. Um, let's move on to the book of Micah. Micah falls right in the middle of the Minor Prophets. In fact, Micah 3.12 is the middle verse of the book of the Twelve. And it is a book about the judgment of God against Israel. Okay, it's a judgment verse. <coughs> Micah is one of the books, and there are six of them. Uh, six of the prophetic books have historical uh, superscriptions, and six don't. 
Micah is the first one we're looking at today that does, and we'll see this in a second, where Micah identifies, it may make you go to the back door next time, because the camera's right there, um, that he's, he's preaching, uh, he's ministering during the time of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now, Micah prophesies against both Israel and Judah, but he only identifies the kings of Judah, and that's fairly common, and there's two reasons for that. The kings of Israel, even for the, the prophets that prophesy against the northern kingdom of Israel, they usually identify themselves by who was king of Judah in the south, because the kings in the north were so horrible, they didn't want to acknowledge them, and because the kings in the north were not of the line of David, they, had no, they didn't consider them legitimate because they were sort of usurpers. And so for several reasons, and Micah is one of those, that even though he prophesied against both Israel and Judah, he only gives reference to the southern kings, not the northern kings, when he's talking about when it is he's working. Now, Micah is a contemporary of um, Hosea, Isaiah, and Amos. It was a very busy prophetic time. Isaiah especially, Isaiah and uh, Micah both lived in Jerusalem around the same time. And so they may have been, you know, commiserating with one another over the lack of responsiveness of the, of the Jews in Judah. But it's also true that um, there are other similarities between Isaiah and Micah. In fact, you might even say Micah is a shorter version of Isaiah. It's, you know, it's, a, a, it's only seven chapters, but it's kind of a condensed, the message is very much the same, a very condensed version of it. There are passages within Micah that are very, very similar to passages in Isaiah, almost verbatim. And again, we believe that probably reflects the fact that the two of them both lived in Jerusalem, overlapping one another, you know, during an overlapping period of time. Um, now, whereas we said that Jonah was a prophet during the time of the, the sort of um, waning period of Assyrian strength, Micah is a prophet during the ascension of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. In fact, you'll notice that time here is 750 to 687. 722 was when the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by Assyria, and 701 was when the Assyrians threatened to destroy the southern kingdom under Hezekiah. So all of that happened right during the time period when, um, when the prophet Micah was speaking. Okay? Um, Micah is very clear in his message, but the structure is kind of hard to be sure of. It's very hard to outline it because he jumps around, as some of them do. Generally speaking, there are three sections, um, but not, you know, d d scholars would disagree about even whether this is a good way to outline it. But the first three chapters are prediction of judgment, the uh, chapter 4 and 5 are prediction of restoration, and then 6 and 7 are pleas re for repentance. Now, Micah has a fairly complete presentation of the, that three-part prophetic message, and you remember what that is. One, you have broken the covenant and you better repent, plea for repentance. It's not in this order, but it's, there's the three messages. Secondly, if you don't repent, then there will be judgment, the prediction of judgment. But even, number three, even in the midst of judgment, there eventually will be restoration, the prediction of restoration. So all three of those messages are present here. Some, not, that's not true for all of the minor prophets, but it certainly is true if you take them all together. Okay? Questions about that? All right, let's start out. Um, and interestingly enough, Micah starts with the, uh, the idea of punishment being uh, prepared for the people of Israel and the people of Judah if they don't repent. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. There you get it. Exactly these kings. And even though he's speaking to both north and south, he only refers to the southern kings. The vision he saw concerning Samaria, the northern area, the, the capital of Samaria, uh, the capital city of Samaria of the north, northern nation of Israel, and Jerusalem, the capital city of the southern nation of Judah. Remember, they often would use the name of the capital to symbolize or to represent the entire countries that they, they were over. So this little passage right here gives us when he's speaking, and it's a summary of his message. You know, the, the vision he saw concerning the northern kingdom and the capital of Samaria, the southern kingdom and the capital of Jerusalem. Hear you, hear you peoples, all of you, listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart. 
like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? A high place was where they worshipped foreign gods. So when he says, what is Jacob's transgression, meaning the transgression of the Jewish people, it's the northern kingdom of Israel. And what is Judah's false worship? It is the southern kingdom, represented by Jerusalem. Okay? Or the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Jerusalem. So he's saying, north and south, you both are the epitome of a violation of God's desires and will. Okay? You both, both nations, have violated the covenant and offended God. Therefore, I will make Samaria, again representing the northern kingdom of Israel, a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. Rocky soil is good for vineyards, all right? You don't want black, fertile soil for, for vines. You want rocky, you know, thin soil. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. This is now Micah speaking uh, for himself. For Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judah in the south. It has reached the very gates of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Condemnation for idolatry, for breaking the covenant of God, both north and south. All right? Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it is a time of calamity. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. All of this lament about God's judgment. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. Do not prophesy, their, their prophets say, do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. These are the false prophets who would say, stop saying these bad things. Which happened a lot. Jeremiah, for instance, had opposition. He got thrown in jail, you know, etc. Um, you descendants of Jacob, the Jews, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright? In other words, if you don't like hearing that things are going to go bad, you wouldn't be hearing that things are going to go bad if you, were, if you weren't acting bad. If you were upright, then my words would do good to you, and you would find them pleasing. Now we come from that condemnation, very strong condemnation, to a declaration of uh, restoration and peace in uh, Micah 3 to 5. I obviously don't have all of this stuff up here. I've, I've picked certain verses to represent it. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion. Zion is, is Jerusalem. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. And you've heard this passage. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A sign of not having to have war anymore, of having a time of peace. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree. No one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. As the nations may walk in the names of their God, all the nations may walk in the names of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So this promise of restoration that comes. Now, right before this, by the way, in chapter 3, there's a passage about condemnation of the leaders. It's kind of, <clears throat> if you've ever been in a leadership position, it's a little bit scary, but you know, you might want to make sure, you're all reading this stuff anyway, right? In advance of us. So Micah 5. The messianic expectation now comes out here. And again, there are passages here you're going to recognize from Christmas time. Marshal your troops now, city of troops. This, he's speaking, you know, uh, well, marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler uh, on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one, will come for me, 
One who will be a ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Recognize that? Mm -hmm. this, is one, this is the prophecy that the messianic figure will come from Bethlehem. And it's called Bethlehem Ephrata because there are three Bethlehems. And so this differentiates it as the city of Bethlehem, which was later the birthplace of Jesus. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned and the time when she, is in labor, she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. All of this is prophetic about the coming of the Messiah. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. Now the Assyrians at this point had come to represent all enemies of the people of God. And so again, it's a... When they use a specific reference like this and you say, well, well what's with the Assyrians marching in? I mean, that, that that's, doesn't seem to fit with the Messianic expectation. Uh, well, Assyrians here means any who oppose God's will and the people of God. Okay? And then Isaiah 6. Uh, this, past, this chapter, Isaiah 6, is similar to the covenant Micah. lawsuit, it's called, which is in Isaiah 1. I told you about the similarities between Micah and Isaiah. So, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. In other words, God is saying, if you've got some accusation against me, if you've got some charge against me, then, then say it now. You know, tell me what, what it is that you think I've done. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam, woman. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shethem to Gil Gilgal, and you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? This is the area, you remember, one of the three accusations against Israel was that they had, they had ritualistic religion. It didn't mean anything to them, they just went through the paces. That's what this is referring to. Burnt offerings, you know, thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of, of olive oil. These are all things that were part of the sacrificial system. But is that what it's going to take up to make you happy? And the point is, just going through the paces is not what he's looking for. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Shall I sacrifice my child? And there's also a messianic prophecy in that, sacrificing sacrificing of the Messiah for the sins of the people. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. This may be one of the, uh, six, Micah 6, 8 is one of the most beautiful and most important passages in all of Scripture. If you memorize any passages of Scripture, this should be one. He has shown you, O mortal, some translations say, O man, but it's not a masculine word. It means person, you know, so mortal. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Very powerful. And then, the last chapter, Micah 7. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest, in fertile pasture lands. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. Again, restoration. Nation will see and be, nations will see and be ashamed, deprived of all their power. They will put their hands over their mouths, and their ears will become deaf. They will lick dust like a snake, uh, like creatures that crawl on the ground. They will come trembling out of their dens. They will turn in fear of the Lord our God, and will be afraid of you. Now, they're talking about other nations. This is a restoration of the people of Israel, and the other nations will no longer threaten them, but rather will be fearful of them, and will come out and say, Teach us about the Lord your God. Who is a God like you who pardons sins and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? We've talked about that, that doctrine of the remnant. That when judgment comes against the people, God will never completely destroy. It is the theology of remnant. Remnant means a small number who are left over or left, who are, are part and different. God has always promised he would maintain a remnant and from that remnant would regrow his people. This is a reference to that. Um, forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. 
You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob, which means to the Jewish people, and show love to Abraham, again, the descendants of Abraham, as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Right? The full package. You've broken the covenant, you need to repent. If you don't repent, there will be judgment, but there will eventually be restoration, at least for the remnant. Yes, all right. Um, so Jacob is now Jewish, yes? Jacob was always Jewish. But Esau has never been Jewish. Um, the, the Jewish people are exactly Jacob, whose name became Israel, right. and his 12 sons. That, those are the nations of Israel, which are the Jewish people as defined. These, the other people are Semitic, meaning they're descendants from Shem, but unless it's Jacob, from Jacob through the 12 tribes of Israel, they're not considered the Jewish people. They are not the people of the covenant that God made the promise. Those are the people that Moses, you know, there's, there's different covenants. The Abrahamic covenant was for all descendants of Abraham, but then the Mosaic covenant were for the descendants of Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel who were in Egypt. And so the Mosaic Covenant is the fulfillment. When they talk about you violated the covenant, it means the Mosaic Covenant, which was a much more specific covenant. And that was only for the 12 tribes of Israel that were in Egypt. It was not the other descendants of Abraham that are Semitic, but are not part of the Jewish people. Okay, thank you. Sure. John. Uh, sometimes we, we, we have a tendency to look at this from a, a strictly historical perspective. In a, in, a, in a sense that it really doesn't apply to us in 2013, but 7-8, seven, 7-7 and 7-8 is just so richly powerful, and I'd like to just read this. It says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. Boy, that speaks in a, in a time when we live in social darkness and, and, and all these abrupt, sudden, and expansive changes that are taking place. That, that really speaks to me. Okay, good. And actually, I, and I had that passage from earlier in chapter 7, but I had way too many slides, and so I had to go back and say, oh, i gotta got to cut some things. So, okay, good. All right, let's look at uh, the book of Nahum. Just three chapters. Again, Nahum is one of the four books, the book of Daniel and then three of the minor prophets, that are, not, are considered non-standard. Nahum is not speaking to Israel and Judah, primarily. And, and in fact, Nahum is the, is the other side of the Jonah coin. Whereas Jonah went to Nineveh, the people of Assyria, and preached repentance, and they repented. Later, they turned against God, and we're talking about, you know, less than 100 years later, and they turned into very bad people. <laughs> and Nahum comes along and, and declares judgment against the Assyrians, the Ninevites. So Jonah and Nahum are, you know, blessing and repentance versus judgment for the same people. Okay? Um, It's also, Nahum also talks about, and when he's talking about the judgment of uh, Assyria, counterbalancing what Jonah had to say, he identifies the fact that God had used the Assyrians as his tool in judging Judah, but that he also, the Assyrians are always listed amongst the, the, the declarations against the nations, and that the, here now, finally, Assyria is getting a specific addressing of the judgment coming against them in the book of Nahum. Okay? Let's look at some of the passages. From the start, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and events his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. Doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. He's slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. All you need to know is all three of those places were renowned for being fertile, having vineyards and orchards and great produce. And he's using them as an example that even the most fertile places will dry up. 
The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can stand against his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. Now, I probably don't need to say this given all the passages we're looking at, but there is a, there's a strong... We clearly are reading about God's righteous anger and God's, God's wrath, God's judgment. And yet there's a movement amongst Christians, especially in recent years, to try to completely do away with any reference to God's wrath. Carolyn and I were just looking at, um, there's a wonderful song, In Christ I Stand. You guys you all know that song? Christ Alone. You, what's that? Well, Christ Alone. In Christ Alone. Christ Alone. Beautiful song uh, um, written by, I think it's Phil Geddes. Um, and they wanted to include that in the new Presbyterian hymnal. But there's a passage in there that says, And on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God uh, is satisfied. Yeah. And the Presbyterian church wanted to change it and say, and take out the wrath of God and say mm -hmm. the love of God was magnified. I think that's what it was. Um, and, and the writers of the song very rightfully said no. And the Presbyterian church said, but you don't want to talk about the wrath of God. You know, it might give people the wrong impression. Might give people the wrong impression. <laughs> Actually, they said that would be detrimental to their education as in church, oh, their church oh education. Gosh. Wrath of God, much? <laughs> okay, and this isn't just Old Testament stuff. God has not changed. There are things that cause God to be angry. There are things that cause God to have wrath, and that's part of what our belief of God is, in God is, and that's what these books are about to a great extent. Now, the same God who is wrathful is wrathful for a reason. It is a righteous wrath, and he always promises restoration. He is not a God who is not compassionate, but he is a God who is holy. And being holy means that there are standards, and if you violate those standards, you should expect him to not be pleased with that. Okay? So that's a very important principle you need to understand in the context of this prophetic writing, but also in the context of the fact that Christians don't even want to talk about this stuff anymore. You know, in many churches, a class about... The prophets talking about the wrath of God, they go, oh no, you don't want to read that stuff. You know, that might that might hurt you. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, if you don't teach the wrath of God, then how can we as Christians um, come to understand when you see so many um, non-Christian or evil people gaining so much possession and yeah. wealth and whatnot? I mean, if you, how are you going to expect that God's going to you know, judge them if you don't believe in the wrath of God? Yeah, I mean, how's it all going to work out in the end? You know, yeah. so we're in of righteousness. And we're going to see in a few minutes, God actually finishes one of the minor prophets by saying, am I going to just let all these people who do these terrible things just get away with it forever? No. You know. Okay. Um, I just need to comment on that. I've got something, Car something Carol and I were talking about very recently with regard to that beautiful song, In Christ I Stand. Um, this is what the Lord says, continuing the same place in, uh, in oh, just a little further in name. Although they, talking now about um, the Assyrians, this is judgment against Assyria, and Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. I'm sure there was a time when the Assyrian kingdom was so powerful, thought people thought this is going to last forever. You know, Hitler thought he was founding the, the thousand year Reich, you know, that it was going to last for a thousand years. Uh, maybe 15? <laughs> Somewhere in there? Um, there has never been a kingdom that lasted forever. And we Americans need to remember that too. Um, Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. He's cutting them off. Assyria will stop being. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temples of your gods, temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. It turns there, and he's speaking, he stops speaking judgment to Nineveh and Assyria, and he turns to Judah and says, Rejoice, the one who brings good news. His foot is on the mountain. So it is a judgment against the Assyrians and Ninevites and a promise of restoration for Judah in that one passage. Wow. What's that? I was just saying oh, yeah. that's a prophetic. Right? For Jesus there. 
Right. The feet of one who brings good news. The messianic, yeah. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress. Watch the road. Brace yourselves. Marshal all your strength. Get ready for all your worth and prepare to fight back, and it's not going to help. <laughs> the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. That always means the Jewish people. Like the splendor of Israel, through, through, uh, though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. Nineveh summons her picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. Their protective shield is put in place. I love the imagery we get here. Um, in fact, there was more wonderful imagery I had to cut out because it wouldn't fit on one slide. Um, <laughs> the practicalities of it. The river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. It is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away. Her female slaves moan like doves and beat on their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. Stop, stop, they cry. But no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless, the wealth from all its treasures. She is pillaged, plundered, stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble, every face grows pale. Where now is the lion's den, the place where they fed their young, where the lion and lioness went, and the cubs with nothing to fear? The lion killed enough for his cubs and strangled the prey for his mate, filling his lairs with the kill and his dens with the prey. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. The references to lions there, if you've ever, how many people have been to the British Museum in London? Okay, they have a number of reliefs that were taken from um, digs in, in what, from ancient Assyria. The lion is one of the most popular of symbols for uh, the Assyrians, and they're described as being like lions in their ferocity and their you know their ravening kind of hunger, and so much so that the Assyrian kings kept lions, caged lions, um, so they could hunt them. You know, and they would release lions, and then the kings would go out and, and you know, hunt them. But the, the lion is an image of, it was the most feared animal in the ancient world. Okay, the lion. Um, they didn't have mosquitoes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm serious. The mosquito is the most dangerous animal in the world by 10,000 fold. More people die from mosquito than anything else. Uh, than everything else, almost. Um, so I have a reason for hating them. Uh, <laughs> the wrath of Ross. The wrath of Ross. <laughs> so that's why you get the strong symbolism of the lion uh, being a representative of Syria. Yes. Question. In 2.6, where it talks about, um, I think it's 2.6, the river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. Yep. Did I read correctly that that history proves that that actually happened? There was a flood and the river... Uh, broke its banks and inundated Nineveh? I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I do. I think there was a commentary somewhere that, okay. that pointed that out where that, that historically happened. Okay. Well, frequently, one of the weakest points in a city, because cities had to have water, and they frequently are built on the banks of rivers because that provided protection on one side. Um, if they had the river actually come through part of the city, which means that they had access to ongoing water, one of the weak points of a city protection would be the gates, because you had to have, they had to be able to let the water flow through if they were going to have the water accessible from inside the city. Well, those city gates, many, many, many cities were taken by the, the water gates not being as powerful as the rest of the fortifications. Uh, and so my assumption was that it had something to do with that. But I don't know. You could be right about a flood. I don't know that. Okay. Woe to the city of blood. There's a whole series of woes in here, and I've only given you one of them, but there's five different woes that, um, that Nahum presents. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, uh, galloping horses and jolting chariot, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears. Again, I love the the imagery that you get here, the picture. <clears throat> Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord. We'll talk about vivid imagery, here you go. 
I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? And then the last verse in Nahum, which is verse 19 of chapter 3, says, All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall, for who has not felt your endless cruelty? Assyria was famous in, in, a, in a time when it, cruelty was the order of the day. Assyria was especially cruel. You know, they, they would capture their enemies and flay them alive. And, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. They were renowned for the cruelty. And yet, God's judgment is coming on them and did come on them. All right, the book of Habakkuk. This is a great book. All right, they're all great books. But Habakkuk... Um, <laughs> Was it ever in the Bible study series on Habakkuk? You know, it makes a great Bible study. It's a multimedia. Um, and a multimedia presentation, yes, that's right. And they had a Bible study series too because we did the Bible study many, many years ago. Again, Habakkuk is one of those uh, books that does not have a historical superscription. Habakkuk himself does not write when he's writing, but the message is very clear in telling us that this is just prior to the Babylonian invasion of Judah. Now. What, because Babylonia, uh, the, the Babylonians invaded Judah more than once, you know, and then it kept getting worse until they finally completely destroyed the city in 586. This could be in 597 before the, the, you know, the, the big invasion. They had come by first and got tribute. And 590, uh, 596 or so, they took off um, a large group of people in deportation. So it's either 597 or 587, depending upon which of the, the invasions of Babylon into um, Judah we're talking about. Again, Habakkuk, contemporary of Jeremiah. That's when Jeremiah was writing. It's during the time leading up to and, and during and after the destruction of Jerusalem. The message is very familiar, but bless you. But the style is quite different. The style of Habakkuk is quite unique because it, it is a dialogue. All of it, um, even, even the last chapter, which is a it's psalm, it's a song. It actually has instructions for the music director, like a psalm does, like some of the songs do. Uh, it's a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. There are um, the, the chapters, there, Habakkuk has two complaints, or challenges, or questions, depending upon. Uh, Habakkuk is always respectful, but he's pretty blunt. He questions God, or complains to God, and then God answers. And then he has a second complaint to God, based upon God's first answer, and then God answers again. And then the last section, which we have here, is his prayer of praise, which again is a psalm. With, with instructions to the music director. Um, there is an emphasis here, like with Nahum, on the day of Yahweh, or the day of the Lord, as being the day of judgment. Not as much as Zephaniah, which we will look at as our last book, but still it's in here. Now the first complaint that Habakkuk has is, God, why don't you do something about Judah? They are so horrible, why aren't you just letting them slide? Why don't you do something about these terrible people and the fact that they're breaking your covenant right and left? So, Habakkuk 1 starts out. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? <coughs> or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Habakkuk is, Habakkuk is talking here about the people of Judah, the Jewish people in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah. Why, God, aren't you doing something about this? I keep asking you to, and you don't do anything. This is the first complaint of Habakkuk. And then God answers. And God's answer is, I'm getting ready to do something about it. Look at the nations, he tells Habakkuk, God does, and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if I were, if, even if you were told. Get ready, Habakkuk, I'm getting ready to do something that could shock you. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. By this time, the Babylonians had already conquered and destroyed Syria. They are now the, the power in the region. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. 
Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all become in, they all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. That's how people would conquer fortified cities, or that's how the Romans conquered Masada, for instance, you know, the, the, the mountaintop um, uh, where the zealots were holding out in southern, southern Judah. Um, then they sweep past like the wind and go on, guilty people whose own strength is their God. So, Habakkuk says, God, why don't you do something about Judah and how horrible they're being? God says, I'm about to. In fact, I'm about to do something you're not going to believe. I'm going to take the Babylonians and use them as judgment against the people of Judah. Well, we then get Habakkuk's second complaint, which is in response to God's statement, and that basically is, Babylonians? How can that be right? He says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Here he's talking about the Babylonians. Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe, against the Babylonians, again the Babylonians, pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net, he gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. In other words, he worships his own power, the power by which he has captured all these people. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? You're going to let the Babylonians keep doing this, even to the people of Judah, as bad as they are? I will, and, then, and then Habakkuk says, oh, but you're God. He says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So Habakkuk says, okay, I'm, I'm a, a watcher. That's one of the words that's translated prophet, is a watchman. And then God gives a second response, which is his final answer to uh, Habakkuk, which is basically, yeah, I'm going to use the Babylonians to judge Judah, and then I'm going to judge the Babylonians. Their time's coming. He says this, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time, it speaks of the end, and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy, Babylonians, is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and take captive, takes captives all the people. He's, enough, enough is never enough. He keeps wanting to conquer more. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn? This is eventually. The time will come. God is saying the Babylonians are going to get theirs too. Saying, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your predators suddenly arise, the people you've stolen from and you've taken from? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Yes, I'm going to use the Babylonians in judgment against Judah, but the Babylonians are going to get theirs too when the time comes. Okay? When he says to write that down, was it written for the people at, of that time? I mean, yes. Did he prophesy this whole thing to those people? Yes, and all these people that are writing this stuff down, they're also speaking. You know, they're preaching as well. But then um, there were pre, um, pre written, pre literary prophets like Elijah and Elisha and others who didn't write anything down. They were entirely <laughs> preaching. But these guys who are writing these books down, they also are preaching at the same time. Jeremiah preached for many, many years before God finally said, Now write this down. And he wrote it down, and the king tore it up and burned it. And so they wrote it down again. So, yes. They wrote it down. It was available. That stuff was, you know, was 
but it, the writing down was simply summary, you know, a summary of everything that they were preaching at the same time. Okay. So when it happened, the people were definitely, I mean, like, wake up. Yeah, well, they told them. But again, that's why you had all of these false prophets who kept saying, stop saying those things. That's not true. That's not going to happen. We're not going to be judged. We're not going to fall. So they knew what the message was, but they refused to accept it. All right, the last section, the last passage of Habakkuk, and then we'll, we'll quickly look at Zephaniah. Uh, this is the hymn or prayer of Habakkuk, who basically says, I will wait upon the righteous will of the Lord. And again, if you look at it, in, I didn't have to put them in here, but it has instructions for the musicians here, uh, the director of music. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. And I cut out a section here. Sun and moon stood still in the heaven, um, stood still in the heaven, sat the glint of your flying arrows at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness, you stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. I will wait for the judgment on Babylon too. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Even when it looks really bad, I still will rejoice in God. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Great little book. Okay? Now let's finish up with the book of Zephaniah. Um, Zephaniah is one of the ones that does have a historical superscription, but it's a little different. And I'll, I'll mention what that is to you in a second. Um, the theme is the day of the Lord. It is central to a number of the books in the, in the book of the Twelve, but more Zephaniah than anything else. As I say, he mentions the day of the Lord 17 times between chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, in that one section, 17 different references to the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment. This comes toward the end of the Neo-Assyrian period, when Babylon is arising and is just, you know, Assyria is coming to its end. It is a prediction of judgment against the whole earth, especially Judah, but it is judgment against the whole earth and, again, the promise of future restoration and blessing. Uh, two sections. Um, the first two chapters and the start of chapter 3 is judgment to come in the day of the Lord and then restoration, the salvation uh, in the day of the Lord at the end of chapter 3. Let's look at this. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Quick explanation. Um, this is the only historical superscription that goes back four generations. You know, he defines himself as the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Now, there may be a couple of reasons for that. One, this may be King Hezekiah. It may not be. We don't know for sure. But if this is King Hezekiah, then Zephaniah is trying to make a point that he is the great, great, great grandson of the king. And Hezekiah was a good king. He had some problems, but ultimately he wanted to do the right thing. Uh, that may be one reason that we get four generations, which is a lot more historical reference than we get in any of the other prophets. The other reason why it may go back four generations is you'll notice that it came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi. The nation of Cush was a black African nation immediately south of Egypt. The nation of Cush, during a number of periods uh, during, during this Old Testament time, Cush actually controlled Egypt. <coughs> and therefore, there were Cushites who were, because Egypt was a, uh, an ally of the nations of Israel and Judah at various times, Remember, Egypt was the opponent of all these other guys, and so Judah, for instance, kept flip-flopping back and forth between Egypt and Babylon before it fell. That's one of the reasons they got crushed, because they made a wrong choice there. But the Cushites, there is evidence, we actually have a reference in Scripture to a Cushite, um, and so we have that idea. To say that he's the son of Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, may mean that, that he, uh, he was half black, 
that he had, his father was a black African. It may mean that his father was named that in honor of somebody because the, the Kushites were actually fighting for the nation of Judah at one point, or there may be some other reference. But the fact that he is, his father was either Kushite or was related to that or may have been you know, involved in the military and so was named for that, he may have given us four generations in order to sort of verify that I really am Jewish, even though my father or somebody else may have some connection, you know, somebody else in the family may have had a connection there. My, my lineage is still very much Jewish. So either because he wanted to link himself to the king Hezekiah, if, that's who, who this, if that is the right Hezekiah, or because he wants to verify that even though my father may have been a Kushite, I'm still Jewish. All right? Through my is father's... Is not a black... Three kings was one of them black. No, we don't know. Any, we don't even know there were three kings. Okay. Um, yeah. And the, the whole thing about who they were and what color they were and what their names were and all that's all made up. We don't know anything about that. that. It's all just tradition. Yep. Oh. Um, yeah, they frequently will have one white, one black, and one brown. You know, yeah. uh, and that's <laughs> just. And just trying to cover us all. Yeah. Just. All right, um, so that, that's some of the explanation for that. Uh, and it is during the reign of Josiah, who's a really good king. He's the, probably the best king of the south that had a complete renewal. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. I will destroy all mankind on the face of the earth. This is beginning to sound like Noah, isn't it? Yeah declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship, the pagan worship of the Canaanites, in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry hosts, because they worship the constellations and stars as well, the moon and the sun, um, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech, again, one of the gods of the Canaanites, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of Him. Be silent before the Sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. There it is. <coughs> I'm going to go through this pretty quick because i only got a few more minutes. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, the day of the Lord, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and those clad in foreign clothes. That's a reference to foreign influence. <coughs> and particularly, if they were so influenced by foreigners they wear those clothes, then they probably were worshiping foreign gods and had other influences that were not according to God's will. On that day I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold. You step on the crack, break your mother's back, you guys. <laughs> there actually was a superstition that you step on the crack or the threshold of a building and you would, you would, uh, it would be bad luck. And that was a sign of pagan practices. So, mm. don't teach your kids that. Um, <laughs> I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, which again is a sign of pagan superstition, and will fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior, which is God, shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath. The wrath of God. We're not supposed to sing about it anymore? A day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like, like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. But there's still a chance. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what He commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, all right, south of Egypt, in Africa, my worshipers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings, all of the Jewish people, to be called back together. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you've done to me, because I will remove you from your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty, haughty on my hot holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant, there it is, that theology of the remnant. 
The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Here's the restoration. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The great restoration. But Zephaniah actually ends on a slightly different note. This is the last passage. At that time, the day of the Lord, when judgment comes, but then God restores, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. This is the great ingathering of the Jewish people. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. <clears throat> So at the same time that he's gathering the remnant of the people of God who worship him and are true to him, he also will deal with all those who oppress them. He will not let that go past. Um, any questions about any of that? I'm only two and a half minutes over. <laughs> I got one question. Yeah. Uh, the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Battle of Assyrians. Assyrians. Uh, that was laid to waste, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. Did it? And when when did they finally find it? Well, they uh, 19th century they uncovered parts of it. There are parts of it that have never been uncovered. I don't think. Uh, there's a famous ziggurat uh, near Nineveh that they uncovered, and there's other parts. I mean, they found some of the uh, ruins of some of the temples. That's where some of the British, you know, British stole stuff from every country throughout that part of the world. Um, and it's in the British Museum. Um, so it was in the 19th century when archaeology was really getting underway in the beginning. Of it. But they're still doing work there, you know, in that area. And they're still finding stuff all the time. Thank you, folks. <laughs>